At that time, if anybody outed you or they found out your parents would disown you, the school would kick you out, you'd lose your scholarship, you'd lose your job. So. On October 28, 1966, a priest, prominent gay rights activists, Columbia College administrators, and a small group of students, including a sophomore who went by Stephen Donaldson, walked into Earl Hall for a meeting. When they left, the first gay college student organization in the country had been established, the Student Homophile League, but it wouldn't be officially recognized by the university until the following year. So what led up to this critical moment? And what struggles did the newly formed club face in the weeks and months to come? Robert Martin, the bisexual Columbia College sophomore, who used the pseudonym Stephen Donaldson, was one of the meeting's primary organizers, despite having only arrived at the university just over a year earlier. In 1965, the environment on campus wasn't welcoming to gay students. As a first year, Martin had to leave his dorm after his roommates asked to be removed from their suite. They didn't want to live with a gay man. It was in this social environment that the idea for the club was born. You know, why not? Why not have a student gay rights organization? You know, they have all sorts of other clubs and it sounded like a good idea to me. <laughs> I mean, that's just human rights, you know? This is Shauna Anderson, one of the original SHL members. When I was a freshman, they did all sorts of orientation things for us. And one of them was a mixer with Columbia. So I met this guy that I was attracted to and invited him back to the dorm. And um, we were talking and I said, I really, you know, like you, you know, let's, let's go out. He said, well, you, you know I'm gay, right? And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I don't know what that is. Um, he said, yeah, you know, I like men. I like you, but I'm not in a sexual way. So we became friends and we did things we hung out together. And I, it was his idea. This was his real name was Bob Martin, but he changed it to Stephen Donaldson. Another hurdle the club faced was finding a faculty sponsor. It found one in university chaplain John Dyson Cannon. In its retrospective on founding the club, Donaldson said Cannon had put his own neck on the chopping block for us. In no little measure, because of his action, he was forced to leave Columbia in 1970. Another major player also came from the chaplain's office, Bill Starr. John Cannon was the, the head of all the religious organizations, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, Hindu. Um, but Bill Starr was the one sort of on the ground, day to day, encouraged us, gave us meeting space in Earl Hall, um, and was, was there for the, the rest of the time that, that we all were at uh, Columbia and Barnard. The support of the chaplain's office allowed Donaldson to plan meetings like the October 28th one to acclimate university administrators to the idea of having a pro-gay club on campus. The day that we were supposed to present, they brought us up to the boardroom, this very impressive boardroom in uh, Low Library. And he's at one end and it's filled with old white men. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, maybe this isn't such a pro forma thing at all. Maybe this is like a really big deal. <laughs> so we, you know, Bob talked most of the time, but he said, this is, you know, and I don't even remember. I was so like, I just sat there. Like I was so embarrassed. I couldn't believe that I was kind of doing this. So the university said yes, and didn't think it was that big a deal. And then there was a lot of blowback from the alums and the athletic department and all these things. Although its meetings began in 1966, the club wasn't recognized by the university until April 1967, in part due to Donaldson's desires to keep the club roster anonymous, as confidentiality was a key part of the organization. The club was approved on the basis that it would be an academic club hosting talks and writing about homosexuality, instead of a social club for introductions and parties. But in reality, it was both. I think when this became a thing, then people knew it was a safe space to come to, and people slowly would come. Because it was still such a, the stigma, you know, if you went into that room, people knew who you were and what you were, 
and so a lot of people didn't want to take that risk. They would meet outside, you know, of course, if there were parties or something like that, but not officially on campus. That was, it was harder to overcome people's own self-loathing and, and worry about societal sanctions. The university's recognition of the league caused immediate backlash. The story was picked up by the New York Times, and an alumnus wrote an editorial in the Los Angeles Times entitled, Sick, Sick, Sick. However, not all of the reactions were negative. In one of his letters, Donaldson wrote that, We received a great amount of mail from gay alumni, including a couple hundred dollars in donations. By 1969, there were chapters of the league at New York University and Cornell, and by the mid-70s, there were independent LGBTQ groups across the nation. SHL continued under the name Gay People at Columbia Barnard, and still exists today as Columbia Queer Alliance. In retrospect, seeing that there wasn't anyone that had a club or an organization anywhere on any campus, this, in, in hindsight, it was a big deal. 